I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Welcome to Side Hustle Fridays. This Friday, we're covering ghostwriting. Joshua Lisek started at an early age, gives all the best tips on how to do it, get started. He makes a great living and you can as well. So here's Joshua. Josh Lisek, ghostwriter, also author of the book, The Best Way to Say It, How to Write Anything from Blogs to Books with Epic Persuasion. You've ghostwritten over 50 books. You've written two novels. All those numbers mostly correct. Yeah, I know. Although right now I'm ghostwriting 55, 56, number 57. Wow. Do you think people during the lockdowns have decided to write more books? Yes. And for not the, all the same reason. Some people have been sitting alone with their thoughts, haunted by their thoughts, that desire to write the book they've been wanting to write for 20 years. And so now it's, it's, it's time. I can't stand myself anymore unless I do this. And the others realize that when they look at year over year, revenue growth, their percentage increases are in double, triple, in some cases, quadruple digit growth for their business because they've leveraged the opportunity to gain increased market share. And with that has come additional profit to reinvest into the business. And one of the wisest things that they're doing is seizing mind share in the world of their market. And that means, what can I do that will install myself as the go-to expert in this industry, as the authority, the credible one who wrote the book on my industry. Oh yeah, I should write a book, but I'm so busy in my business, I don't have time to do it myself. So I'm going to work just as I work on my business, not in my business. I'm going to work on my book, not in my book. I'll be the author. Someone else will write it for me. Yeah. And it makes sense because as you know, I like every time I write a book, I always say to myself, I am never going to do this again. Like it is very painful some people say, oh, you have to love the process of writing a book. I don't really love the process of writing a book. It's extreme. I like writing articles and then somehow weaving them into a book, but it's very painful actually to write a book, <laughs> particularly if you're not, if you haven't done it before. And I can imagine most of these CEOs or whoever have not done it before. No, no, they, they haven't. They haven't. In a lot of cases, they, they wonder what happened to me. I've been able to write speeches and white papers and briefs and executive summaries and, and, you know, incredible long form content. <clears throat> but then something interesting happens. It's like a, a paradox of uh, writer's block. They sit down in front of their computer, they type chapter one, 
and their mental library. They begin going through all the topics that they could write about. And then they get lost and it goes from 5 a.m. Now it's 6 a.m. Oh, 7, 7.15. And they barely have half a page. And there's all these things they want to write about all at once, but they don't know the best way to say it. And so nothing is really said. And I always tell people, find the most, um, in all the cat things you want to write about, find the most in emotionally intense moment and put that first. You're going to rewrite later anyway. So you might rewrite it, you might not. But just start with something like an incredibly intense moment and just start with that. So this way you know somebody will at least turn the first page. It's usually my go-to technique. And that's wise from, I think of, think of books as copy, right? I, at least I do, because yes. the first chapter is essentially the sales letter. Why? Because people like me who listen to Audible books or read Kindle books or even will go to Amazon, what do we do? We go read the first chapter, which is free. So the first chapter must function as a long-form sales letter for the rest of the book. And that's where you want to put, as you'd mentioned, some of the most emotionally impactful moments for the reader. So that's like, okay, I'm sold. I'm ready for this. Right. Like you, you could always tell a book written like, like a biography written like 30 years ago. It always started off like, I was born in Lexington, Kentucky. My father was born also in Lexington, Kentucky. Like they always start off with where they're born and what they what their parents did. But you can't start a book that way anymore. Like that people will just they'll they'll close the book right away. Yeah, a lot has changed, it seems like in just the past, well, past few decades, but also in the past few few years. What's really hot right now is a mashup of multiple categories and subcategories. For example, um, within the industry, they call them journey memoirs, where Yes, it's a biography, but it's also a crossover into a category like, oh, health and wellness or management and leadership or entrepreneurship, where you're, you're teaching a how-to topic, but it's through your story. It's like blending the two together. Yeah, actually, I feel like that's the category I probably fit into is that mashup category. Yeah, and it's both the easiest one and the hardest one to write. It's easy in that you know, for the most part, the author knows what the how-to is. But it's the hardest in that, well, which part of my story do I tell and which part do I not tell, right? And then having the third party of the, of the professional ghostwriter to tell, <laughs> you know, here's my whole story. You find the part that makes the most sense for, uh, for being in the book. I want to eventually get to like how you got into it and so on. But like, I'm, I have some questions about what you just said. Like, do you ever find with some of your writers uh, or some of the authors convincing, you have to convince them to share some of the embarrassing or, or, or bad moments in their life? Because <laughs> you have to be, they have to be vulnerable a little bit. They have to show problems. Like that's a story is you have problems. Yeah, yeah. So I, I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. Whenever an author says, Joshua, this cannot go in the book, but that has to go in the book. Can you give me an example? Are you allowed to give me an example? Yeah, yeah. Um, without going in too deep, but the that, that particular example I had in mind was an author who had had a rift with her sister and her and her mother. Um, she, she's a, a public a public figure in a Western state, and she's like, "There's no way I can I can you know go into that territory." Like, how can you be the authority on a topic if you're not able to go out and say I've actually lived it? So yeah. those moments where you know, oh, I, I better use a hypothetical example. Like, no. If you have the lived experience, you need to lead with the lived experience. We can change the, you know, alter some of the details, tone it down a little bit, but the story itself, especially the ones that are like, oh, I can't, I can't say that. I can't let people know that that happened to me. Well, as long as it doesn't diminish the credibility, your credibility on the specific topic you're teaching or the industry you're in, but it shows you in a, in a, a vulnerable moment, which again is key, it's not you looking like a complete loser in your profession, but it's, it's something else. It's like, oh, okay, this person is a three-dimensional individual, not a, not a super guru who's perfect, but someone I can relate to, someone like me. Right. And have you ever had an author like totally just disagree with you? And I mean, this must have happened like, and just wouldn't let you write the, the, the one scene you really thought was important to write? All the time, all the time. We have, we, we go as far as we have a kind of a hard and fast rule of three. I mean, 
we don't own. I mean, everybody has the rule of three, you know, in, in all, all domains. Somebody has, there's a rule of three for just about everything. Uh, but in our case, like I will tell an author that is a terrible idea three times. I'll give a different reason three times. I'll say, here's, what, here's the reason why it doesn't functionally work for that section. If they push back, but I really want it. Like I, I have, I've always dreamed I would have this, this story, you know, this in my book, or I really don't want to have that. That's too far. Then my second pushback will be an emotional reason. Well, here's how it can make, here's how it can make readers feel. They get to this, right? And then the financial reason, if they push back the second time. And my, my third insistence is, well, this could be a financially costly decision if you decide to go through with this. And, and if they insist on all three of those, uh, if they handle that objection, then okay, it's your book. Let's do it. Well, what's the, how, how do you give, make the financial argument? Yeah, the financial argument. A good example would be um, when an author is describing, and I, I gave you kind of a, I guess we, we briefly touched on an example of an author talking about mistakes that they had made directly in their business. And if they don't close that loop but talk about, oh, you know, I, I, I you know, lost a lot of money, but I, I learned a lot of lessons. It's like, well, you have set the precedent of yourself that you are someone who, who loses in this case, you know, you, you lost a deal, you, 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 you made these mistakes, but there wasn't necessarily a redemption moment. There wasn't a, a closing of the loop. Um, or there's, there's personal failings, you know, perceived personal failings, I guess you could say, um, where there's a relationship that went awry or there's something along those lines. And it's like, oh, wow, you, you, you know, mentioned that you cut ties with a certain family member or whatever. I kind of like to know why mm. you did that exactly. So especially at the higher level of, of authors where they're known by literally millions of people, we have to be excruciatingly careful with everything that you say about them and how everything might come across to the, the broadest number of people. And that still matters even to a consultant or to a coach or to an e-commerce entrepreneur who's working on an ebook. You know, everything has to be designed to demonstrate their credibility rather than to diminish it. And I always joke that nothing diminishes your credibility faster than a book you shouldn't have written. Yeah, that's very true. I know you can't say names. Well, in terms of uh, scope, what's the size of the audience of the most popular person you've had to ghostwrite a book for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I made the calculation a couple of years ago, 170 million people. Oh my gosh, that's pretty big. Yeah, and he... Um, I won't go further than that, but he, beyond the fact that he, um, not United States based, not United States based. So I have, I have about half of my clients are from somewhere else around the world. How do they find you? How do they find me? YouTube. Oh, okay. I didn't even know. You, you have like a YouTube channel where you, sh you share your, uh, your tips? Yeah, yeah. Little, little things such as um, you know, everything from how to write a book proposal to get a traditional book publishing deal to how to get a literary agent to how not to get scanned by the wrong ghostwriter. And I'm, I'm targeting keywords that result in only a few dozen, a few hundred, a couple thousand views. Like I'm, I'm not going viral over on YouTube, but I've targeted keywords that have very low competition. I simply show up towards the top of search results and the people that are searching for those keywords like how to hire a ghostwriter, I show up towards the top. So it's like, okay. I'll reach out to him. Wow, it's so interesting. Like you have um, what losing 55 pounds taught me about ghostwriting books. Yeah, that, was, that, that got me several health and wellness clients. Like, oh, he's someone who's actually had a weight loss journey himself. Nobody is more qualified to write my weight loss book than someone who's already done it. What are the, what are the most popular books that people want ghostwritten? Most popular books? Broadly speaking, business, but like a better way to get something done from a business perspective. Yeah, like you wrote the the sixty minute entrepreneur. Yeah, the sixty minute startup. That was that was a, a award winning book. That was basically like what what is the fastest way to start a to business on the side that gets paying customers within a month? So you're not spending years, you know, on a passion project that doesn't pay off. Um, that would be that would be one of them. So very deep expertise on one thing. In in let let's say there's you know, a decision making framework that's really big right now is. You as an, an expert, as a business person, you have some sort of a special framework or a secret sauce or a method that you've gotten results for your clients, but you want to take it out to the broader populace. And, and having a book where you 
show a little leg, so to speak, is the expression I, I heard Jay Abraham use once. Like that's that's what you do in there. You take your framework and you you go behind, you know, pull back the curtain, you show how it's how it's done through your book, which demonstrates, wow, this person's success wasn't luck. They've got a system. And what did you think of, you also wrote Mass Persuasion Method by Bushra Azar. Did you learn persuasion? Do you learn from these books? Yes, yes. I, I joke that uh, Joshua Lysak as an individual soul uh, no longer exists, but rather I am the composite of all the authors I've ghostwritten before. That's probably true though. Like you have to learn at a very deep level each thing. And, and my guess is you remember more than if, like I, if I read a book, I'll remember one or 2% but you probably remember most of the books you write. Yeah. I don't even remember most of the, I don't remember more than, I would say I'm 40% or 50% on the books I write and one or 2% on the books I read. Yeah, yeah. I think in, in, in my case, it's because I have to come to a level of understand where the author is coming from and what their unique voice is. So like Bushra and Ramesh have completely different voices. And yet I was able to nail both of them. And I'll give you an example of this, you know, uh, Bushra, she, she came out and did like a 45 minute testimonial video with me talking about how the process was for her. And in it, she said something to the effect of when she released the book, everyone, when they read it, they heard her voice 100%. There was none of this editing out her voice. And, you know, she's got quite the, quite the bombastic personality over the top, which makes her memorable. And when you're memorable, you find yourself being persuasive. Now, Ramesh is the calculating, analytical, like he comes from management consulting. So his is almost like a tactician's approach to business. And both of those books have to represent you know, each of them. Otherwise, it's like, hmm, this doesn't really sound like you. And again, the, the, the bigger your audience, the more important it is you feel like the real deal when you release stuff to them. So how did you get into this? How does one start being a ghostwriter? Completely by accident. In my case, my dream going back to when I was a little tyke was to become a novelist one day. And so I'm, you know, our college years finally come around. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write these novels. And so I did my first book. My first novel took three years to write. And so I've, I've, I, know the, uh, I know the sorrows and the joys of, of authorship having done it myself. I wrote a follow-up book to that. I was able to get both of them, um, uh, both of them were published wow. and then something happens. I'm going around back in the days where you were doing book signings and events and author panels and all this, this fun stuff, meeting, meeting readers and shaking hands. Two freelance writing clients I had, because I'd also started a freelance writing business. This is, I'm now in my, going in my 11th year uh, in business right now as a professional writer. This is the very beginning of that journey. Independently, two clients found about, you know, found my book, they read it, and they said, Joshua, you don't know this, but I've read your book, found out about your novel, because I saw something about it somewhere. And I have to say, I was surprised by how good it was. Because you're like, what? At the time, I was 20 years old. And we're like, um, so I've been wanting to write my book since I was 20, and I'm now 70. Do you think you can help me finally get it done? And I said, okay, fine, sure. I'll help you with your book. Now, in their case, it wasn't a novel. It was memoir. It was, it was still story. Yeah, it's all story. That's right. That's right. And I said, oh, okay, sure, I guess. I didn't even know that there was such a profession as ghostwriting, James. I did not even know. I said, okay, sure. Uh, and that first project turned into a couple of referrals for the second, third, and fourth one. And lo and behold, I'm now on numbers 55, 56, and 57 all these years later. How, how, can I ask, how much did you charge for the first book? Uh, I actually charged quite a bit because I, I charged hourly and it took us a while to get accomplished. And I think roughly I brought in, I think about $43,000 for that first one. Wow. And you were 20 years old. Oh my God. You're so, you're, you're, you're lucky in that at the age of 20, A, you were working on jobs that paid significantly well, like for a 20 year old, that's incredible. And B, you found what you love doing and you monetized it from day one. Like you didn't, you didn't work any shit jobs that you hated. <laughs> like that's, that's pretty good. 
Yeah, yeah. And I had the motivation too, because I had gotten, you know, I've, 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 I've three college, uh, I've graduated three colleges. And so I've, I've gone that path and I lasted 11 months on the traditional eight to five uh, path. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was asked, what was that moment, Joshua, where you're like, yeah, I'm not doing this. I'm doing my own thing. You know, at that, at that ripe old age of, of 20. At the time, my first job out of college was, uh, a, I think it was at Inc., Inc. 1000 or whatever. It was one of those companies, a telecom company. The CEO comes into my cubicle and he chews me out over something. And unironically, James, unironically, he says, Joshua, by not getting tasks A, B, and C done, you're costing me $1 million. Your job right now is to make me $1 million. Get tasks A, B, and C done. And of course, I was being paid $12.50 an hour, despite my degrees. I thought, hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. That was the moment, and I shared a little bit more in my uh, TEDx talk, that I'm like, okay, we're going to be drafting the, uh, the letter of resignation here. And I had had my client at the time, the first ghostwriting client, so I'm like, well, I got somebody here who wants to pay me more, a lot more than the easy Yahoo's are, so I'm out. And so after that first client, were you worried, will there be a second one or, or am I going to have to find a job again? Or was this... Oh, I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but but you you probably had it like again for twenty years old you probably from that forty three thousand I don't know if you were spending all of it but you probably had enough for six months worth of living at least yeah yeah but it, it was definitely that that sort of a feast or famine it was it was quite a massive feast but you can kind of see that there's a, there's going to be an end to it that there's going to be an end to this meal and so you know, I was you know, promoting, the, promoting the novels. I was, I was you know, putting myself out on the freelancer marketplaces, taking on other gigs, taking other projects. And so strangely enough, I transitioned from being primarily a ghostwriter to being freelance writer for hire for anything from resumes to cover letters to your product descriptions on your Amazon page to like literally anything you would need written. And that allowed me to sustain a, a full-time living as a professional writer all these years. And I haven't had one of those, you know, famine moments again. And it's, but it's a delicate, delicate balance amongst two things, project management and lead generation. Any professional writer, if you can nail project management and lead generation, you'll have a job for life. I also imagine it involves discipline too. You have to be able to sit down every day and say, okay, from nine to 11, I'm going to work on this book from noon to three, I'm going to work on people's Tinder profiles or whatever they hire you to do. And then from three to six, I'm going to work on this guy's book. And that's where the project management comes in is because I've got everything out on like a timeline. So I know what the milestones are. I know what has to be getting completed by then. So I, I feel like using, using the software I do, it feels like I have a, a general manager who's telling me every day, okay, Joshua, here's what you have to get done today. And the decision made in advance. So I don't have to sit there and think, oh, shoot, got to pull out my to-do list. What am I supposed to do today? Oh, and then half an hour is gone and I'm stressed over all the things I have to get done. Well, some of them have to get done today, some tomorrow, some next week, some six months from now. So what is the highest priority thing right now? So first to get in the door, you had already written two novels and you were doing freelance writing and one of your yes. freelance clients contacted you. Let's say someone doesn't have the two novels. Maybe they could write a bunch of posts and put them on medium and then compile them together into a book and self publish. And they need, they need that foot in the door to say, Hey, I'm a writer. A lot of advice books say, just say you're a writer anytime, but you really need to get something written to be a writer. So what, what would you suggest? So if someone want, really loves writing, wants to get into this, what should they do first? I think in my experience, I, you know, writing for like, you know, B2B businesses or, you know, businesses that sell other businesses or businesses to consumers, businesses that sell to consumers, or to individuals, just people who want to write a book, a legacy book, a memoir, autobiography. I found that the easiest sale is, Joshua, you doing this writing job for me results in me saving time or making money or saving money and I guess creating more time in my schedule. So there's some element of time and money. And the closer I could get me writing this for you to you saving time or making or saving money, the easier that sale is because then it's not about the writing. It's about the time and it's about the money. And I've, I finally felt this formulate in my head when I learned about the jobs to be done framework or jobs to be done theory, where the concept is customers, clients, they 
buy tools to get jobs done. There's functional jobs, there's emotional jobs, there's financial jobs. You know, I want to do something, I want to feel something, or I want to make money or save money. And realizing that writing is not about the writing, it's not really about you, it's about the functional job you're doing and how it makes them feel and then how it makes them money or saves them time, it's really easy. So it's not you, you know, pitching your friend's business, hey, you know, can you hire me to write? It's, would you like me to say five hours per week for you? I see. So, so they get some experience writing, however it is, like, you know, again, Medium articles or LinkedIn articles, whatever. And then some, how would they connect to that first client, do you think? Do they do an ad? Do they call up everybody they know? Do they post on their Facebook wall like, hey, available to ghost write a book? I put out a strategy that a lot of people have been using rel- relatively, I guess, for, for my YouTube channel, which is not the biggest in the world, but it doesn't need to be. A strategy that goes a little like this. You want to get your first client. Okay. Who is going to be the, if you're a professional writer specifically, you want to be a professional writer. It goes a little like this. What business are you closest to right now? Or businesses. These could be friends. These could be connections. These could be uh, people who follow you on Twitter. These could be family friends. But there are business people that you know have very little time and there's things that they need to get done. So my recommendation was find a prominent podcaster, like a, you know, a, a marketing podcaster or a, an advertising expert or someone who's a prominent voice who's advising a new strategy. For example, maybe Russell Brunson. You're listening to Russell Brunson. He's saying, you got to build a funnel, got to build a funnel. You know, funnels all day long. And then you mentioned, hey, you know, I was listening to this podcast here today. I'm sure you probably listened to Russell Brunson as well. He was talking about having funnels. And I noticed, you know, on your website, it doesn't look like there's any funnels. You just have the, you just have the one, you know, shop page or whatever. You know, I, I wonder if this a funnel is something you want to get built. And so it's not about, hey, can you please hire me? Because I don't know what I'm going to hire you for if I have more tasks to do than time to do them. So it's, again, it's not about the getting hired for the writing. It's, hey, you know, there's this expert that you've told me that you trust because I see that you follow them and you liked a couple of their posts. You probably heard what they've advised. I don't see you doing it is because of the time. Oh yeah, I know everyone talking about how great building funnels is. I just don't have the time for it, you know? And so then it's not you, the aspiring professional writer saying, would you like to hire me as your per hour writer? Because what does that even mean? It's here's this authority, this expert, who has advised you, someone in his or her, their audience, to try this thing out, and they're not doing it, and you can come in and you can be that lifesaver, and it's a, a, a hire of convenience, because now you can come alongside them. And, and so there's a couple of people who joined the best way to say it, actually, I'm teaching them to do exactly that. And it's simply connecting to the, the I wouldn't even call it the lowest hanging fruit, James. I would call it the lowest hanging opportunity. Yeah. So it's almost like you create the opportunity for yourself. So like you could find someone who's out there, who's maybe given some talks or written some articles and you could say, Hey, this is an interesting topic. How about you? Like you could even pitch someone like Russell Brunson, like the, the funnel Bible and the top 10 best practices. Uh, and you could even pitch the outline to someone like that. And all they have to do is say, yeah, let's do it. And you've got a client. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it goes back to the, the jobs to be done framework is so useful because there are jobs that they want to get done. So it's not about you, the freelancer, you, the writer, getting hired to write. It's you identifying what jobs they probably want to get done. The business person, the the potential client, and then saying, you know, those jobs you need to get done in your business that are related to content. And this can be broad to any service, you know, programming, apps or graphics or whatever, advertising, whatever. There are jobs that they need to get done and you can come in, and come in and simply say, I can get those done for you. And here is how we're going to get it done. And then they're going to say what? Oh, that's cool. Can I see your portfolio? Having hired people myself, I could, I could say this with absolute certainty. When I say I want to see your portfolio, I don't really want to see your portfolio, okay? I want to see one, maybe two demonstrations that you're not full of crap. So one of them could be, let me see your blog. Let me see this one thing you wrote for that, for that, for, you know, for somebody else before. I'm not looking for 
500 pages of glorious expertise. I'm looking for, okay, can you write pretty well? Can you get the job done? That's what I'm really looking for. Is do you have proof that you've been able to get this job done before? So if you had to reinterpret that question, can I see your portfolio as, do you have proof you can get this job done for me, that you've done it for other people before? In any capacity, that's really what I want to see. And then it's a hop, skip, and a jump to saying, okay, you're hired. So after the first book, you started doing more freelancing and then word of mouth or whatever. Did you have to advertise to do the second book or did someone approach you? Yeah, yeah. So there were several people who approached me from some of my uh, freelancer platforms. Back on the platforms, I don't, they don't even exist anymore. They've been you know, purchased and bought and changed names and whatever. Um, but there are people who reached out to me because, hey, I've, I've ghostwritten a book. I've, I've you know, uh, authored a couple of books myself. And so that as an advantage, you might say, being early to some of these platforms and having ghostwritten before and having authored myself, people are like, okay, this guy, this guy gets it. You know, all these other ghostwriters, like they, they're journalists or they're college students with, you know, getting an MFA, a master's degree in creative writing or whatever. But like, I, I want someone who has the experience of, of going through the process. They can relate to me. And I think that was a, a, a winning, um, you know, a winning advantage for me. Did the projects number two, three, four, five, and six pay as well as the first one? No. But by that point, I had decided that, okay, I need as much variety in my income portfolio as possible. I can't just count on one client because that's like having a job again, having one employer. Yeah. Very unwise, very unwise. So I wanted to diversify a little bit. And I thought for me personally that, you know, I'll, I'll write your cover letter. I'll write your, you know, your Facebook posts. I'll write anything and everything for you. No job is too small. $50 for your resume. Okay, let's do it. Have it done tomorrow. That was not really a sustainable business model to really build anything with because I'm constantly in searching for clients mode. You know, do the work, not tomorrow, I'm looking for more. And there's not in that sort of sense of, of security. And after a couple of years of taking anything that could come my way, I realized there's got to be a better way. So I simply applied from listening to podcasts such as yours. I hear about this thing everyone's talking about called the 80-20 rule. You know, maybe I'm a late bloomer, but... <laughs> It was a few years ago I first heard about the 80-20 rule. You know, it's, it's, it's hard with the 80-20 rule. You have to figure out the right 20 that produces the 80. Fair enough. In my case, it was relatively easy. Oh, 20% of my clients? Oh, it's the ghostwriting clients hmm. who are producing most of the revenue. Oh, maybe I should re-rebrand. Re, because I, I started out as a ghostwriter, then the freelancer, and then you know, I have to re-rebrand as, as the professional ghostwriter. But by that point, the fact that I had so much variety in my portfolio was actually a value add because it was entrepreneurs who wanted to use a book to promote their business or to right. build like a free plus shipping funnel. And they wanted someone who understood, well, how marketing is done, where a product like a book fits into a value ladder inside of a business of you know, going from the $17 book to the $47 course to the $199 program to the $5,000 mastermind on up and, and so forth. And since I had created content at so many different points on that ladder, it was like, oh, this guy knows what's up. So my advice based on that would be to understand the ecosystem in which your work exists, whether you're a graphic designer or you are you know, a visual artist or a writer or any type of a service provider, what are the other elements involved in your client's world? Like imagine if you're creating a puzzle piece and they're putting it in there, what are the surrounding puzzle pieces that you very well could either help them with or learn how to help them with? Like with ghostwriting, maybe they're going to use the book to get speaking gigs or coaching gigs or consulting gigs or show that they're expert in their business is an expert in some space. So you're saying those are the other puzzle pieces? Exactly, exactly. So what I've done a couple of times is adapted the author's book into a TEDx talk hmm. or creating a year's worth of content from their, for their blog inspired by their book. Or can you go the other way? Can you take blog posts and turn it into a book? Oh, yes. Many, many times I've done that. Um, those are some of my favorite projects because, hey, Joshua, here's 250,000 words over the last 10 years of my you know, brand online. Find a book here, you know, and it's that uh, 
it's that quote where I think it was Michelangelo speaking of starting with the block of marble and seeing what's there and removing everything that's not the finished product. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And 
I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Was there ever a time when you were like, oh, I cannot work another day on this guy's book? Yes, yes. I, I, did, I, did a, I did a Periscope about that a couple of weeks ago. The worst client I ever had. Uh, this individual, I, I do have a non-disclosure, so I won't go in, in too far in depth. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people like this out here, surprisingly. Is it, is it Barack Obama? You no, know, he literally believed that he was a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot of authors out there who actually state that unironically on their book jacket. So maybe mine's one of them, maybe it's maybe it's not. But that that would definitely be the be the one. The biggest biggest ego I've I've ever seen. How, did he have the money? He sounds crazy. Did he have the money to pay? Yes. Yes. But but funny enough, right before we were, you know, at one of the next payments, he canceled the project and then published the book anyway in that in that state so i got i got stiffed but you know he uh very christ-like very christ-like <laughs> well I, i'm sure his book didn't do so well probably not probably not at the very outset he said he said joshua i just simply want this book to sell three copies i don't care if it sells fewer than three copies because i you know i'm on a divine assignment to share this book with the world so it only sells three copies that'll be fine by me you know a, a little a little bit of these pieces don't really connect in this puzzle a picture <laughs> one of those situations did you ever have an author who um after the book came out he was he or she was so disappointed in the sales that they tried to get their money back or they were a hassle in some other way because some of these ghostwritten books they're not really intended to sell they're not going to be like you know nobel prize winning books or anything right right there have been a couple of of authors who they were disappointed in the outcome the feeling is mutual Feeling is mutual. Remember, I said I pushed back three times. Yeah, you know the functional and the emotional and the financial you know, reason why we're not going to do this. Um, there, there have been a few who bullheadedly pushed past the third one. Like, that's a title you want? Are you kidding? I have no idea what that means. That's a subtitle. I know what that means less than I do the first one. So it's usually authors who insist that their pet title, the title that they've had in mind, or the title that their buddy gave them over a beer at the club. That was the right title to choose. So it's, it's usually not even the contents of the book itself. It's in the presentation of them where the, the go-to-market strategy fails before it, even, before it even begins. 
So that's that's usually where where uh, you know I maybe I should add a fourth or fifth pushback <laughs> on the title and the subtitle itself. Yeah, those are very important because that's the first thing people see. Exactly. What are some best practices? Like I know in your in in your book, you say you know how to write anything from blogs to books with epic persuasion. So what's epic persuasion? Yeah, epic persuasion is you know exactly what you want to. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll use a metaphor. You know, there's what people say, and then there's what we hear. Persuasion is you make that a one to one match as much as possible. That what people hear, what they see, or what they read is as exactly as what you intended as possible. Because we all think our ideas are great. Just under, I just gotta make sure people understand it. If only they saw how valuable this was, they would buy it, right? Okay, so how do you be persuasive, friend? Well, let's explore the value. So the, the process I teach inside the best way to say it is starting with the brain dump, right? Where you get anything that you could possibly say about a topic onto the page. And I like to I like to think in clouds. So and imagine imagine a giant word cloud in the sky, multiple multiple word clouds. Like each each cloud is a word, right? And you can manipulate each of these clouds. The brain dump process is to put all your clouds in the sky. Let's take the simple example of digital marketing. Okay, so one cloud is um, you know email marketing. Another cloud is copywriting best practices. Another cloud is webinars. Another cloud is this. And you got all up in the sky, right? I can write about all these different things. So maybe you're going to choose the, the cloud on doing webinars or free training. So I'm going to write a, write a blog post, write an article about you know, webinars that convert. Okay, so what are webinars? What, what do you do to run a webinar that converts? Without any self-censorship, without any, that's not going to work. Simply put all the little clouds in the sky. Write down everything you could possibly say. That's the, the first step of the best way to say it is the brain dump process. And then from there, you then restructure everything into the order that makes the most sense. What do I mean by make the most sense? It gets people to the conclusion where they now want to run a webinar that converts for themselves. So then what, based on what you've got on the page, what needs to come first? What do I need to know first so that I'll get closer to the conclusion of I want to run a webinar that converts too. Okay, what comes after that? And to borrow a tip from, from you, James, because I do talk about this as well, you want to have an emotion-based hook at the very beginning. So your, your very step number one is, is, is kind of tapping into emotion a little bit in that restructuring process. And it's, it's literally simply cut and paste, cut and paste inside of your Google Doc or your, your Word document, everything that you've, that you've laid out from your, from your brain dump. It's simply ordering it. And then once you've got everything in the right order, you find out, okay, where are the leaps in logic? Where are the gaps? Where are there absolutely no transitions? And I go from talking about, okay, so the first slide should be of your webinar should be this. And then your audio control should be set at, wait a second, we just jumped from telling me how to create the first slide of my webinar presentation to talking about audio. How? What? So that's, a, that's a, a complete break in logic. And that is an anti-persuasion maneuver because I've now said, okay, I'm out, All right? We want to get them as close to the end as possible to the point they say, oh, I have to have one of these webinars that convert. I have to do it myself. And that, of course, can lead them to the decision where they want to buy your webinars that convert program or your DIY package after they've read your webinars that convert article or your webinars that convert book. So that would be kind of an example of how you would take a broad topic you, you, you circumvent writer's block by telling yourself it doesn't have to be perfect the first time and put everything on the page and then restructuring it into linear or chronological order or functional order, in this case, of following instructions to create a webinar that converts. I like this methodology of, okay, there's, there's a goal, which is like you're going to write about webinars and here's all the, let's say, one through 20 of how to run a webinar. And then... Like you said, you have to get that emotional hook at the beginning of each step. So maybe there's a story or something that goes in each step. And then you interweave the kind of methodology with the storytelling. And then you have a book. Exactly. And, and you, you hit it perfectly too, because you want to have a story for everything. You know, like the, the most boring books are just textbooks where it's all like how to or instructions or getting into details or worse, hypothetical example. 
right. suppose you are building a webinar that is on a topic of interest to you. Like, no, no, that's on a tutorial. That's not going to fly. Okay. It would tell me about a client that you worked with on their, on their webinar or one that you did yourself. And so each time you're teaching a subject or a topic, you got to have a story around that. I'm, I'm now at the point where, you know, for most nonfiction projects, we have one primary story that opens the chapter and then we end it at that cliffhanger moment where tell me what happened. And then, so as you just saw in this story, and then we get to the point of what that story was, and then we teach what was about to be taught to the person at the opening of the story. So now you've got that open loop that you just, you feel pulled in. And that, that comes from hypnosis, by the way. It's a little principle of hypno writing to bring in. And then at the very end, you know, the person's story continued. So you recall such and such person that we began, that we began, you know, ran with at the beginning of this uh, story. This is how things turned out. And that open loop, close the loop works so well, especially with those journey memoirs that I was telling you about. So wait, what's the hypno writing technique? So I open it up with, you know, one time I was giving a webinar and the power went out uh, midway through. And here's here's what I did because I had a plan B ready just in case this happened. Uh, but then when you know it, uh, uh, you know, so 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 everything was working out okay. But then wouldn't you know it, someone in the audience had a heart attack, and then you go into the next chapter. Uh, like, what's the hypno? What, what what's the hypno technique? Yeah, yeah, it's it's from intentionally opening a loop that makes you go, well, what happened? So what happened? I mean, entertainment does this all the time. You know, with your your favorite your your favorite shows, they always end on a cliffhanger. That's yeah. the open loop that feel that you feel pulled. You have to know how it ends because the way that our both our conscious and subconscious minds work is we always have to rationalize. We always have to, to find the end of the story. That's why we obsess over closure from broken relationships or from things that didn't work out. We have to find the answer, right? That's how we're, we're hardwired. And our subconscious minds are consistently processing in the background the close, the open loops throughout our day and, and trying to rationalize and create closure and, and assign excuses and as that, that famous meme, I, don't, I think it was from either Futurama or The Simpsons, where the little, the, the little, little uh, uh, yellow man is looking down. And he's like, could I be the problem? No, it's obviously them. Like the two-panel meme we've all seen. Uh -huh. Like that's the subconscious. The subconscious is always trying to close loops. And so by opening a, an intentional loop, and when you say in your story, and that's when the power went out, dot, 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 and then you go into teach the importance of having backup plans. Yeah. And at the very end of the chapter, so after the power went out, and then you finish the story at the end, now that that loop has been opened. And it's, it's a great way to pull people through a chapter so they don't, get, they don't allow other distractions that come up throughout the day um, to get in the way of reading the book. Do you have a cliffhanger at the end of the chapter so they go into the next chapter? Yes. And it's, it's often a preview. Like, okay, you've just learned this. You've just taken this away. And now you're going to do this. Right, you're going to build on it, so give a little, little bit of, of excitement. It's, it's it's classic copywriting. You know, I have to know what comes next. It's always what comes next, and it feels like you're you're being led rather than pushed or told or or lectured, lectured, lecture. And, and an author voice that feels like a lecture, yeah, it's the is worst. not an author voice. That is a that is a, an amateurish mistake. And what's the uh, what's the best result you've had from the fifty five books? 55 books. Um, I think probably I, I would like to run with um, probably with Ramesh, a Ramesh Danta. So his book, The 60 Minute Startup, the way that that process began is, and we'll get to the cliffhanger of why I say it's the best one in just a minute. Um, at least it's, I think it's my, my, my favorite. And I think Ramesh is favorite too, because what the book meant to him personally. When we began the process, he just started a podcast he was, you know, he had a couple of side hustles going on in addition to his main job of management consulting, specifically for software and tech companies that wanted to run agile project management for their tech projects. Hmm. So that's his thing. And he thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could teach, if I could teach aspiring solopreneurs, like service-based business people or e-commerce people, they just want to make a couple thousand bucks a month on the side to start out. What if I could teach them agile project management in this? So classic idea sex, right, James? He has agile project management, bring it together with um, a lean startup, like an ultra lean startup. 
bringing those two together, the result was a 60 minute startup is literally working on your business for one hour a day. It's such a great title too. Like that's the perfect title. I just from the title, I feel like buying it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so did a lot of, a lot of people. There was one point it was selling like a thousand copies a day. It was crazy. It rose to hundred and number 193 of all 6 million books on, on Amazon. Mm. And that book has, and Ramesh will say this himself. So he, he, uh, he went ahead and uh, went public and ghostwriting going public is something very different. And ghostwriting, you know, he went public and announced Joshua was my, was my writer for this. This is, you know, this wouldn't have happened without Joshua. Um, and I love that because he did not come to me with the 60, I want to write the 60 minute startup, Joshua. He came to me with Joshua. I, I have this expertise in agile project management. I've been a serial internet entrepreneur since 2000, 2001. I've seen everything. And I want to put together a book that can help people get results quickly. And so together we, we use the jobs to be done framework, frankly, what is the functional value, the, the unique, the new, the fresh functional value? Well, agile promises, test, iterate, get results, quick, move, right? That's the agile way. Mm -hmm. And so in business for solopreneurs, that means you waste no time. You get to something, you can sell the customers as fast as possible. And then when we added up the hours, it equated to, okay, following the agile way, doing all the fundamentals, it's going to take you about 30 hours to get your, your, your very first customers, Ramesh and I calculated. And lo and behold, that translates really well. I said, Ramesh, what if we make it one hour a day and we call the book The 60 Minute Startup? And we call it a proven system. Remember the jobs to be done framework? It's, it's functional, right? Like it works. It's a proven system. Like, okay, the title sold me. But the fact that it's proven, and by proven, what we did is we took 30 entrepreneurs that Ramesh had interviewed on his podcast, and we made their stories start each of the chapters for each of the 30 days. And what they did in their business mirrored exactly what Ramesh was teaching you on that day. So it was, it was like all the stars aligned, so to speak, with his podcast and his guests and their stories and his past and what he wanted to teach. And it, it won the, the, the gold medal, the number one marketing book um, of all that entered the reader's favorite uh, contest. Beat out tens of thousands of books, I hear. It was, it was quite remarkable. So that story behind the book, that's why it's probably my, my favorite project. At least that I can talk about publicly. I'll put it that way. Yeah, and probably he wanted to talk about it publicly because it's his method in action in the sense that he didn't have to spend the time writing the book. He outsourced it to you. I mean, you used all his content and his ideas, but but he was able he was able to do it in an agile way. The 60-minute book basically for him, you know, he was he, for you it took longer than 60 minutes, but for him uh, as far as project management goes, it's probably pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think about the, the uh, other uh, authors that, that have meant a lot to me and the book has meant a lot to them. Um, I have confidential, confidentiality with a few of them, but I'll tell you that the most emotionally valuable books have been the, the family memoirs. Mm -hmm. Like, I grew up in World War II. You know, my first memory is from the inside of a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Like, those stories, they're probably only going to be read by a few hundred people or less. Or like the family, friends, like... They just want to have everything that they've learned in life that they may not be able to teach to their grandkids or great grandkids. And they want to make sure that those lessons are never lost. They want their legacy in print. That's great. Forever. And funny enough, that was my first, my first tagline when I, when I started as a ghostwriter. I said, I put your legacy in print. Like that's going back almost 10 years. That was my first, my first pitch. And it turns out that that appeals primarily to the memoir audience and that works for that audience but not necessarily for people who want their expertise in print or their framework in print, right. for example. Have you um, done ghostwritten fiction at all? I have, I have. And they've been business fables, you know, kind of yeah. like, um, you know, Who Moved My Cheese, uh, The Go-Giver, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, those types of books where you're telling a story, but it's having some sort of a business purpose that's being illustrated. So what are you working on now? You're working on three books. How did these clients come about? Yeah, yeah. I think probably from Twitter. I think all of all of them came from Twitter. Yes. 
Yeah, one of them saw my vid- you know, YouTube videos. They didn't follow me on Twitter. And I, I, I'm uncensored, unhinged, completely raw and real Joshua Lysak on Twitter. That's my favorite platform to be on. Um, you know, dispensing a little bit, of, uh, little bit of writing and publishing wisdom um, in between the, uh, uh, the, the controversial tweets out there to drum up a little bit of ire. Yeah, no, I've seen your Twitter feed. It's always interesting read. And what writing books would you recommend? Writing books. Good question. I I like writing resources. So there's, um, I believe there's uh, Words That Sell is a great resource for teaching the different words that assign different, like they have different um, uh, emotions behind them, call for different emotions. So I think that's the most important thing to learn about writing is what you say can make people feel a certain way and therefore act a certain way. So that's a great guidebook. All of the the copywriters and ghostwriters I know, I recommend that too. For building a a quick and a fast writing business, the book that I followed myself was um, The $100 Startup by Chris Gillibo. That was the one that found me when I was in that phase of like, what exactly am I doing here? Am I a copywriter? Am I a freelance writer? Am I a ghostwriter? What am I? And his one-page business plan for a service provider that, that changed the game for me back in 2012. I think that book came out. Wow. So, so this is it now. You're going to probably do this ghost writing. You'll probably write like 500 books by the time it's all said and done. Likely. I see no, I see no reason to quit. If I were to say what my, my bucket list ambition would be is to uh, ghost write a presidential memoir. Yeah. Without I, a non-disclosure agreement, I should say. Because if I did it, but no one knows did it, did I do it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would probably be like if you could write Trump's uh, memoir, that would be probably, you'd probably get some interesting dirt. Now, uh, uh, do you want to write a novel anymore? Yes. Do you think, do you think writing all day other people's words gets in the way of your own creativity? No, I think what it does is as I deplete my own creative energy, the, the little bit that I have left, what do I most want to spend this dollar on? Yeah. So to speak. And then it's like, I, the one thing I choose, it's going to be good. And I'm actually working, collaborating with a, uh, an established fiction author um, on a lit RPG series because that's like kind of a, a sleeper hit of a, of, a, of a category right now. Basically, like, it's an RPG video game, but in print. Like, you know, uh, gamers are the, are the, are the literary uh, audience for lit RPG. So is it like a Ready Player One sort of thing? Um, yeah, I think that I think that would be considered game. It's like game lit, where there's a you know video game, but the but lit RPG is really focused on leveling up your abilities and interacting with other characters inside of this kind of uh, open world environment. And there's different side quests that could ah. happen along the journey. It's it's basically it's a video game in print. It's like um, you know Red Dead Redemption in print, or it's um, you know Skyrim in print. And I literally mean that like okay, the opening chapter is how to navigate the menu. And that's literally what you're reading. And gamers, they, they love it. It's a perfect marriage of publishing and gaming in that one genre. Oh yeah, that's, that sounds fascinating. So uh, when, when are you working on that now? Yes, yes. We've almost got the, the first one done, but we're going to release the trilogy all at, all at once. Um, looking at probably summer 2021. Okay, let me know when that, when that comes out. I'll play with my kids and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and have you ever looked into like other genres like comic books, screenplays, anything like that? There's been people who have asked me about those things over the years. And I've given some tips, but I haven't done much outside of your general trade nonfiction. I've done a couple of textbooks over the years, um, you know, for, for, for academic audiences. But for the most part, it's general trade nonfiction and, and fiction. Well, this has been great. And I think, um, I think your story is inspirational. The fact that you were able to kind of do what you love and, and find out how to monetize it so early and really get a good, you have now a good enough client list that you're pretty much set. Like you're not gonna, it's not like your credibility could be questioned. It's you, you've done, you've done great books and, uh, and I, I, I have to, uh, it's my fault. I haven't gotten this. I have to, I will definitely get this. I'm, I'm really curious about reading the best way to say it, how to write anything from blogs to books with Epic Persuasion with Joshua Lisek. Thank you so much for, sharing your knowledge about ghostwriting with the audience. That's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on today, James. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I really appreciate it. And, and definitely let me know when that game comes out. I want to play it and, and uh, see how it stacks up. It sounds good. Thanks, James.
Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.